Welcome to Somerville Livewire. I'm Mary Ellen Muir. Somerville Livewire is a bi-weekly program covering local issues sponsored by the Boston Institute for Nonprofit Journalism in partnership with the Somerville Media Center. Livewire is part of the Somerville News Garden, a grassroots effort to stop Somerville from turning into a news desert. Check out somervillewire.news for news about Somerville. So today we're going to talk about artists. For more than a year, when we haven't been working in grocery stores or providing essential services or keeping Zoom schooled kids from bouncing off the walls or working remotely in bed, surrounded by empty bags of chips, we turn to the arts. Whether it's movies, concerts, interviews, or any number of new ways the creatives have come up with. If we were looking for entertainment, whether it was to stave off boredom or connection to stave off loneliness, this has been a crisis for the artists in our community. So we know that Somerville has been a good place for artists, especially since they were priced out of Cambridge. But how big is the artist community? What impact does it have on our economy and on our culture? And how have artists in Somerville survived the past year? And beyond that, what role has the city played? So to discuss these issues, we're joined by Greg Jenkins, Executive Director of the Somerville Arts Council, and Kelly Chapman, who is an artist and director and program manager at Studio at 550. The Somerville Arts Council is the local cultural council, LCC, for the city and serves to celebrate the arts and community. The board is appointed by the mayor, Joe Curtitone. Greg, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Studio at 550 is an artist exchange that prior to the pandemic taught classes and rented space to artists for performances and other events. Callie, thank you for joining us. Thank you. So I was on Callie's website and I noted the following that was posted last March um, or a year ago, March at the very beginning of the pandemic. With an abundance of caution, Studio at 550 has shut its doors starting March 16th, 2020. Um, this was to launch a sustainability fund, um, which was established to keep the studio at 550's bills paid due to canceled classes and rentals, as well as provide ongoing support as we continue our relocation plans due to redevelopment of our co current location. So in addition to a pandemic, um, this studio had to move. We anticipate these expenses to be around $28,800, and at the time, a little over $2,000 had been raised. Callie, I was wondering if you could tell us what's happened since then, because that sounds very dire. <laughs> um, it, it does. Um, I can give you a little bit of like what happened. Um, Basically, we shut our doors in March, um, and even as things reopened, we decided that it wasn't safe for us to do so at the time because it was shared tenancy in the building, um, and the second floor tenant had people coming and going, and we couldn't really get people upstairs, and it just wasn't safe to do that. Um, so we terminated our lease as of December 2020. Um, and shuffled all our stuff out of there um, due to the redevelopment of the, by the proposed redevelopment of the building into micro unit apartments. That's what they wanted to do with it. It still hasn't been, <laughs> it's still empty. There's, there's tenancy on the second floor and the third floor is still empty. And I think it was a place of launching forward for us to think about what actually is our long-term objective um, by moving out of the building. Um, and we started to look for places in Somerville to relocate to. Um, we have some promising situations that might evolve over time. Um, but we've done some programming um, minimally online, mostly. Um, some performances, some classes. Uh, we did a series that was a, a digital media series uh, just recently, um, which was very successful and kind of interesting to go through. So define success. There was engagement. <laughs> <laughs> there were people interested in doing it. And it was something unique that no one else was doing at the time. And I haven't seen it since. So I think yeah. that. Yeah. 
which is great. But financially, I mean, were you does I mean, were things going well enough that you know how did you survive? I mean, given the fact that you had to cancel your classes, you weren't able to rent your space and so forth. Well, we worked out a deal with the landlord um, at the time. He he was generous in giving us a break um, on most of the rent. Actually, he was like, "I just want you out of there, so I can be on this." <laughs> So that was good, but you know, since then it's like we have no overhead. So, I mean, overhead in terms of rent. Um, so, yeah. So that helped. Mm -hmm. So, what about other artists? I mean, the people who were renting from you. What was their situation, if you're aware of it? Yeah, they just didn't go back to studios. Yeah. Some of them haven't felt comfortable enough to go back to studios at all, and even when there are some studios still open, um, they ceased classes, they ceased teaching um, in, in person in space. A lot of them done it on Zoom from their living room. Um, and that's pretty much the situation now. I think slowly people are starting to become more comfortable and now we're gonna have an inundation of like call for space right now is what we're gonna have. Because people are like, oh, finally we can, you know, out of the <laughs> out of our, our bedrooms and we can maybe rent a studio. But it, there's a there's a little bit of a hesitancy of renting places that are have a high traffic volume. So dedicated spaces are safer for this purpose. Right. Yeah. So lots of complications. And it also was, and we're gonna come back to this, but just um, the cost of renting space in Somerville is also part of the whole real estate issue that we have going on in the city. So Greg, from your perspective, I mean, you, you, you have the larger picture of what's going on in the entire city. I was wondering if you could just start a little bit about talking the what is the mandate of, the, um, of what it is that you're doing? And to a certain degree, where does the money come from? The larger mandate or talking about space in general? Um, I would say, first of all, just kind of define what um, SAC is doing okay, um, and sure. then we can get more specific. Sure. I mean, as you mentioned, the, the, the Arts Council is a, you know, a designated local cultural council uh, for the city of Somerville. I, mean, you know, I work for the mayor, work for city government. Um, we have a staff of around five now for four, Four, five and a five and a half, five point six FT. Um, I mean, we've if anybody's been in Somerville long enough, they're probably more aware of us through all the events that we do, whether it's Art Beat, Porch Fest. Uh, we've done dance events and professional development work, so we do a lot of programming. Uh, traditionally, we've had three youth programs. The Mystic Mural Project is kind of one of the oldest, probably you know, the largest kind of mural probably in New England along Mystic Avenue there, that continues. I think we're in our 27th year. Um, so we have some long-standing programs uh, that we've done historically. Um, we're getting, you know, as I think it, the council's work evolves that we're doing a lot more around issues of zoning, um, looking at arts related space issues, um, we're getting ready to finally do a cultural planning process. Um, for the past, like I'd say 10 months, we've been working with the Metro, uh, Massapolitan, um, Met Massachusetts Area Planning Commission and looking at zoning and the arts and working with a task force, which Callie is a, a member of that task force. Um, so, I mean, we've always been doing a lot of policy related work, or at least I've been doing a lot of policy related work since probably 2005 or so, um, in addition to all the programming. So uh, we started a, you know, a cultural economic development initiative in Union Square in 2005, when there really wasn't a lot of, you know, there was a need for more foot traffic, a need for more love for Union Square. Um, and I think, you know, the mayor was, you know, instrumental in sort of setting us off and saying, you know, go for it and, and kind of carrying the mantle of, you know, quote, cultural economic development. And I think, you know, Somerville was kind of known for that for a number of years. Um, so we had looked, you know, done a craft market, we helped set up the farmers market. Um, we 
you know, uh, did street furniture, you know, amenities, public art initiatives there. We changed the zoning in Union Square, created an arts overlay district. So there were all these sort of very short term interventions to kind of enliven the square. Um, and I shouldn't say just enliven, but looking at the assets of the square. I mean, I think now Union Square is, you know, known and branded for its diverse food network and food, you know, landscape, um, its diversity of people. And I think it's, you know, no short measure of just all the work that we've been doing down there. So that, that gives you kind of a range of things. Um, I mean, obviously in the past, you know, since March of 2020, um, I mean, we too have been scrambling. Uh, my colleague Aritza, I think, you know, from probably April until September, I mean, I think we did 30 um, virtual programming series, 30, you know, different artists. It was a way in which we could help support the artists, paying them at the same time, getting the word out about who they are. Um, you know, we still had an illuminations tour, but it was very much kind of, um, you know, that's traditionally, we've done that for 20 some years with trolleys and community guides. Uh, this year, we basically just aggregated and created a, you know, amazing Google map and drew focus to the community. Um, so like a lot of other people, you know, trying to survive virtually, uh, trying to support through virtual work. Um, and at the same time, we had a series of community meetings with a lot of pretty intense conversations within the community. And, you know, we were fortunate enough that, um, you know, we were able to use, you know, sort of what's called stabilization fund money, similar to like supporting local businesses. We were able to capture, you know, half a million dollars and to be able to distribute that back out to the community for organizations and individuals. Um, and then just this January, we released another $166,000 uh, of programming money. Uh, we still have approximately maybe around 400,000 more that we want to release hopefully in the next, you know, month or two, but thinking more about the money not as like COVID relief, but maybe uh, resiliency forward money or thinking about how are we going to pull out of this, you know, moving forward. So that's, so that's in that's the bigger the, picture what we've been up to and kind of, yeah. you know. So that's that sounds like a lot of money. Um, how does it compare to the demand? I mean, if you were able to give out that much money, you know, did you yeah. have, you know, 500 people applying for it and you could only distribute to 300 or, you know, what are the numbers? The demand that? was around, it's a little, it's a little complex in that there were, we did cap the organizational limit demand at 50,000, but yet some people requested 150. So um, even though we knew in our mind, we shouldn't, you know, we probably couldn't give more than 50,000 to organizations. Um, so I would say it kind of met the demand. I mean, everybody who, applied for the individual grants uh, basically received, you know, between two and $3,000. And that was a bulk of around $260,000 that we, you know, put out to the community. And then I think we gave, now you're pulling in numbers. Uh, we also did a, you know, a sort of a BIPOC emerging artist grant for, you know, uh, as a racial justice sort of, you know, type of category. And that brought, you know, that brought us new, you know, new people into the community in the sense of understanding more about, you know, somebody who was a lot younger, maybe somebody who was of color. Those grants, I think we distributed about 160. In terms of the demand, I felt like we somewhat met a demand. I think there's still more need out there. Uh, but in terms of the cycle, that cycle, uh, if we distributed 500,000 in that round, maybe we had around 650 to 700,000 that was requested. So we did okay. And then three, four months later, we distributed another 166 through our local, you know, um, what's called a local cultural council process grants that we had set aside and so. And is this money from the feds? No, not at all. It's uh, the money is actually, um, I think there's fifty-two thousand dollars from the state, and the rest of it's city money. Okay, all right. So, so these can't... are tax dollars primarily funded from um, property taxes. Is that where the money comes uh, from? It's called a capitalist stabilization fund, and I'm not necessarily the CFO, but 
it's ultimately this, you know, the rainy day fund, so to speak. Each year, the city does a budget. If there's surpluses, it goes back. You know, if you don't spend all your money, it doesn't just disappear. It goes into a fund called a stabilization fund, and then maybe gradually that grows. Uh, but yeah, it's tax base, tax and revenue, tax and fee revenue. So yeah. it's this typical city revenue source, which is property taxes, fees, and fines. Um, yeah. Like any other city city tax base source, not tax so base, I, city I, revenue base, I should say. They sorry, also okay. get they do receive money from the state as well, called local okay. aid. So those are the three. If you want to get caught up in city finances, <laughs> it's local aid, fees and fines, and property taxes. That's how city government funds its operations. Those three, three, what you would call three legs of a stool, so to speak. Right. So as you're talking, what comes to mind is two things. One is two to three thousand dollars is a lot of mon money. It's very generous and so forth. But as we know, living Not in Somerville, much. that's like, you know, two months, three months of rent. Um, so, you know, so people either had to <clears throat> find other jobs, do something else, go live with friends and so forth. Callie, what you know, do you have any personal knowledge of what people have done under those circumstances? I mean, do you know people who had to leave, move, you know, in with other people? Because um, I'm sure, you know, is everybody eligible for, even if you got it, let's face it, you can't survive on that for any length of time. No, I mean, I've heard a couple of, a uh, couple, I mean, a plethora of stories. One was, you know, a friend of mine, she's a visual artist. She has a studio in Somerville as a, um, her studio not her living space she had to move out of Somerville and she kind of like toured New Hampshire and Vermont for a while <laughs> just kind of hopping around to mm -hmm. places that would uh, accommodate her living situation um which she enjoyed actually um but still is kind of weird and then there's this other thing that a lot of artists fell into is like if you were collecting unemployment or you were may be eligible for it, it became very complicated really quickly because yeah. a lot of us have, um, you know, that mixed income thing where it's like W-2s and 1099s and you can do only the W-2, but what if you have to make $5,000, if you made $5,000 or over, you had to claim the W-2 unemployment, which ended up being like, if you were on the cusp, really low amount. <laughs> so then right. like right. they finally kind of fixed it but not really so then you're like well do I work do I not work like what what is the situation where you know it's more stable and I think even the um unemployment that was the 1099 the PUA uh unemployment the pandemic unemployment assistance they started to tighten that a little bit more and required more documentation as of recently. So that became a, another barrier for people to kind of like go through, um, especially if they weren't doing, like I know that, um, like if you were doing a class, right? If you were holding a class in a studio, you would basically get cash from the people who were coming into your class and take the cash, but you didn't have necessarily documentation of that. Right. In a tip, <laughs> like some people did, some people had on, but then the government's trying to ask you for it. And you're like, well, I could, you know, I have cash and that's right. how I did things. So it becomes kind of complicated for yeah, those kinds of, yeah, yeah, unconventional yeah. business model, shall we say. <laughs> right. One thing I would say, it's, I, you asked about demand. We actually did a survey at the beginning of COVID and probably around April. Um, and trying to understand a little bit more about their own economic um, situation. And the one thing that we've always known is that probably around 65% of the Somerville artist community approximately, I would say approximately, um, either work somewhere else or have other types of jobs um, or to a certain extent are being supported by a significant other. And really only about 35% of the arts community are really sort of what I would call a pure play artist, somebody who's like, that's all they're doing in terms of driving their income or a majority of what they would like to do. So there are a lot of, even within Vernon Street, you go through there and during, you know, non COVID times, there's very few people there during the day because they typically are working at other jobs. And that's, 
And I think that says a lot about the arts community in Somerville. It's incredibly dynamic and, and, and resourceful in the sense of that's the reality of a lot of artists in the, in the area. Um, but that's, that's great. So is the survey still open? Because I noticed that you've got a couple of links to surveys. Yeah, <laughs> that was a different survey that was done specifically around COVID and financial issues of what's happening. And that was trying, we were trying to gauge a little bit about what was a little bit about where they were financially, you know, or how desperate are they? Are they, right. you know, do they have, are they working? And then so it was more of an intercept survey that, I mean, I could share it with you later, but it's not, no, I, mean, that's I don't okay. even know if it's relevant now, it's over a year old, but that, that helped inform us a little bit last uh, summer. Okay, great. Well, and you're we talking have... about as a space survey, which is a whole okay. other discussion that's out. Okay, right great. No, let's, um, let's talk a little bit about space. And the other thing I want to um, touch on, and we only have five minutes left, so a time flies. Um, uh, I'd like to talk about what you anticipate for the summer, given that vaccinations are working really well, things are rolling out, CDC just changed something. You know, what do you see happening um, in the summer? I mean, I could speak quickly. I mean, we're, I'm involved with a task force that every week we re-examine the trends of health issues. And, you know, part of the complexity of, of my job was, especially during last fall and the winter, you know, everybody saying, why can't we perform outdoors? Why can't we do this? So Somerville is, um, you know, Somerville is reopening. They just actually issued another guidance announcement today for June 19th that, you know, indoor capacity is going to increase to 200. Um, you know, technically festivals and parades can go back to 50% of things are opening up pretty fast. I think our mayor is still slightly cautious and what we're trying to do is almost align most of the guidance and the policy with Boston. And so to a certain extent, both Boston and Somerville are approximately three weeks, three weeks delayed from what the state is releasing. And they just feel like three weeks will give us time to, you know, see if because of our density, I mean, I think, you know, for, for the state to do something for Hopkinton or, you know, a different part of the state makes sense. But in terms of the level of our density, that's the cautionary measure, but things are opening back up. Um, and I would suspect by, you know, July that we're going to be, um, you know, not, we'll be in a new normal, so to speak. Uh, I think, I think the complexity is people are still scared and people are still hesitant. Um, and we're kind of finding that with, you know, the work that Callie and I are doing on this temporary space. Um, and that's been my point of view too, to even to, you know, to this task force or committee is that, you know, we've done a great job of scaring everybody to death and now we need to start assuring them it's okay to go be, you know, out and be, you know, and get back to work. Um, and I think that's gonna be our struggle for the next few weeks or a few months rather. Yeah, I, I, I think it's, it's gonna take a little bit, but then there's gonna be a tipping point. I'm, I'm predicting roaring 20s in the summer personally. That's, that's, that's what I expect. And you know, we only have a couple of minutes left, but maybe if you guys could just touch on experiences with space because you know, rents you know, dipped you know, as of a year ago and so forth, but everything is kind of coming back or that's certainly the perception. I personally have a friend who's an artist who um, has to leave her studio down Boynton Yards area um, because um, she's just being priced out and the building was sold and so forth. So Greg, just very quickly, um, what are you guys doing? What are you guys doing about that? <laughs> <laughs> Two seconds or less, how are you gonna solve the art space issue in the world? Um, <laughs> <laughs> like I mentioned before, I mean, we do have this task force, Callie's on that. I think some of some people have seen the survey that we've issued with MAPC, trying to understand uh, sort of a space a vulnerability index and create an index, looking at zoning. Uh, on, a, on a real direct level, um, Callie, who I've known for years and years and years, we were really fortunate, the Arts Council, in that we've been working a little bit with uh, the assembly or federal realty folks and kind of pushing them to say, you've got vacant space. Why don't you let us, you know, let's broker an agreement where we can utilize your vacant storefronts uh, and use them for the arts community while you're waiting on a, you know, a better tenant, so to speak. And so with Callie's been instrumental in helping me get this space up um, over an assembly. 
It's a an amazing 5,000 square foot space. We we've put up money to bring in a dance floor, help, you know, we're paying Cali to help us coordinate this. And now it's open to the community. Um, we've got a cohort of artists in there, dancers, theater people, uh, movement people. So it's great. And that's, you know, one thing that we can do. Hopefully we keep picking up other things as well. And I think, you know, last night, the, you know, the city council just, uh, agreed to uh, purchase the armory, you know, through eminent domain. And that's a whole other long conversation that we could have another meeting on or another show about, but. Um, that's huge. Yep, we, um, we, we will have to do that. And we're almost completely out of time here. So you Callie, should talk just, to Callie about the space and how it's wonderful. She's in I was just gonna right say, <laughs> where, can people, explore. <laughs> where can people go to get more information about the space, Callie? Um, well, the, the website is being developed as we, speak okay. um <laughs> the we pilot website. we have a website it's just it's, it's very hard to navigate for people who can't log in right now um it's artassemble.org this is the space this is half of the space um that is being currently used there's a dance floor in here and a black curtain and some cool lights uh, and a sound system needs to be kept at a lower level because there's apartments upstairs um but that this is the temporary space that artists can use currently. And I well, actually want to give a shout out to uh, David and the folks at Assembly yes. and Federal Realty. It's very generous of them. They've been incredibly accommodating um, to us over this. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. And, um, and I'm so sorry we've run out of time, but that's a perfect way to end. Thanks very much to you both for sharing your thoughts and expertise and time um, and getting this message out because it really does impact um, Somerville um, as a community as a whole. Whether you go do artist things or not, um, we all go to restaurants and the places where, where everybody meets at these places. So I just want to thank the Somerville Media Center for production assistance and Binge, thank you for your support. Um, be sure to check out somervillewire.news for local coverage. Send your thoughts, story ideas, news tips to somervillewire at bingeonline.org. We'll be back in two weeks with the next edition of Somerville Livewire.